Welcome to Flourish. I'm Diane Planeden, and you're in the right place if you're ready to create an inspired life. And we do so by working on our own personal development so we can be strong role models for those we love and mentor. Today is chapter 45, week eight in our Queen's University Sec 100 course journey. And I hope you're reading along on YouTube or listening on the podcast because this is really getting fascinating. This is really getting good. And our next chapter is all about intelligence. So let's get started. Intelligence is among the oldest and longest study topics in all of psychology. The development of assessments to measure this concept is at the core of the development of psychological science itself. This module introduces key historical figures, major theories of intelligence, and common assessment strategies related to intelligence. This module will also discuss controversies related to the study of group differences in intelligence. The learning objectives to keep in the back of your mind is to list at least two common strategies for measuring intelligence. Name at least one type of intelligence. Define intelligence in simple terms and explain the controversy relating to differences in intelligence between groups. As mentioned before, I am a student, not a teacher, and this is open courseware. So if you uh, want to access this information, it is openly available on the World Wide Web. Let's get started. Introduction. Every year, hundreds of grade students converge on Washington, D.C. for the annual Scripps National Spelling Bee. The Bee is an elite event in which children as young as eight Square off to spell words like simultricious and apogatura. Most people who watch the bee think of these kids as being smart, and you likely agree with this description. What makes a person intelligent? Is it hereditary? Two of the 2014 contestants in the bee have siblings who have previously won. Is it interest? The most frequently listed favorite subject among spelling bee competitors is math. In this module, we will cover these and other fascinating aspects of intelligence. By the end of the module, you should be able to define intelligence and discuss some common strategies for measuring intelligence. In addition, we will tackle the political thorny issue of whether there are differences in intelligence between groups, such as men and women. Defining and measuring intelligence. When you think of smart people, you likely have an intuitive sense of the qualities that make them intelligent. Maybe you think they have a good memory, or that they can think quickly, or that they simply know a whole lot of information. Indeed, people who exhibit such qualities appear very intelligent. That said, it seems that intelligence must be more than simply knowing facts and being able to remember them. One point in favor of this argument is the idea of animal intelligence. It will come as no surprise to you that a dog which can learn commands and tricks seems smarter than a snake that cannot. In fact, researchers and lay people generally agree with one another that primates, monkeys and apes, including humans, are among the most intelligent animals. Apes such as chimpanzees are capable of complex problem solving and sophisticated communication. Scientists point to the social nature of primates as one evolutionary source of their intelligence. Primates live together in troops or family groups and are therefore highly social creatures. As such, primates tend to have brains that are better developed for communication and long-term thinking than most other animals. For instance, the complex social environment has led primates to develop deception, altruism, numerical concepts, and theory of mind a sense of the self as a unique individual separate from others in the group. The question of what constitutes human intelligence is one of the oldest inquiries in psychology. When we talk about intelligence, we typically mean intellectual ability. This broadly encompasses the ability to learn, remember, and use information, to solve problems, and to adapt to novel situations. An early scholar of intelligence, Charles Spearman, proposed the idea that intelligence was one thing, a general factor, sometimes simply known as G. He based this conclusion on the observation that people who perform well in one intellectual area, such as a verbal ability, 
also tend to perform well in other areas, such as logic and reasoning. A contemporary of Spearman's named Francis Galton, himself a cousin of Charles Darwin, was among those who pioneered psychological measurement. For three pence, Galton would measure various physical characteristics, such as grip strength, but also some psychological attributes, such as the ability to judge distance or discriminate between colors. This is an example of one of the earliest systematic measures of individual ability. Galton was particularly interested in intelligence, which he thought was heritable in much the same way that height and eye color are. He conceived of several rudimentary methods for assessing whether his hypothesis was true. For example, he carefully tracked the family tree of the top-scoring Cambridge students over the previous 40 years. Although he found specific families disproportionately produced top scholars, intellectual achievement could still be the product of economic status, family culture, or other non-genetic factors. Galton was also possibly the first to popularize the idea that heritability of psychological traits could be studied by looking at identical and fraternal twins. Although his methods were crude by modern standards, Galton established intelligence as a variable that could be measured. The person best known for formally pioneering measurement of intellectual ability is Alfred Binet. Like Galton, Binet was fascinated by individual differences in intelligence. For instance, he blindfolded chess players and saw that some of them had the ability to continue playing, only using their memory to keep the many positions of the pieces in mind. Binet was particularly interested in the development of intelligence, a fascination that led him to observe children carefully in the classroom setting. Along with his colleague, Theodore Simon, Binet created a test of children's intellectual capacity. They created individual test items that should be answerable by children of given ages. For instance, a child who is three should be able to point to her mouth and eyes. A child who is nine should be able to name the months of the year in order. And a 12-year-old ought to be able to name 60 words in three minutes. Their assessment became the first IQ test. And if you're watching this on YouTube, they give you an example. So it's really quite fascinating. But example of what you might see on an intelligence test. IQ, or intelligence quotient, is a name given to the score of the Binet-Simon test. The score is derived by dividing a child's mental age, the score from the test, by their chronological age to create an overall quotient. These days, the phrase IQ does not apply specifically to the Binet-Simon test and is used to generally denote intelligence or a score on any intelligence test. In the early 1900s, the Binet-Simon test was adapted by a Stanford professor named Louis Terman to create what is perhaps the most famous intelligence test in the world, the Stanford Binet. The major advantage of this new test was that it was standardized. Based on a large sample of children, Terman was able to plot the scores in a normal distribution shaped like a bell curve. To understand a normal distribution, think about the height of people. Most people are average in height with relatively fewer being tall or short and fewer still being extremely tall or extremely short. Terman, in 1916, laid out intelligence scores in exactly the same way, allowing for easy and reliable categorization and comparison between individuals. Looking at another modern intelligence test, the Weschler Adult Intelligence Scale, or the WAIS, can provide clues to a definition of intelligence itself. Motivated by several criticisms of the Stanford Binet test, psychologist David Weschler sought to create a superior measure of intelligence. He was critical of the way that Stanford Binet relies so heavily on verbal ability and was also suspicious of using single score to capture all of intelligence. To address these issues, Wessler created a test that tapped a wide range of intellectual abilities. This understanding of intelligence that is made up of a pool of specific abilities is a notable departure from Spearman's concept of general intelligence. The WAIS assesses people's ability to remember, compute, 
Understand language, reason well, and process information quickly. One interesting byproduct of measuring intelligence for so many years is that we can chart changes over time. It might seem strange to you that intelligence can change over the decades, but that appears to have happened over the last 80 years we have been measuring this topic. Here's how we know. IQ tests have an average score of 100. When new waves of people are asked to take older tests, they tend to outperform the original samples from years ago on which the test was normed. This gain is known as the Flynn effect, named after James Flynn, the researcher who first identified it. Several hypotheses have been put forth to explain the Flynn effect, including better nutrition, healthier brains, greater familiarity with testing in general, and more exposure to visual stimuli. Today, there is no perfect agreement among psychological researchers with regard to the causes of increases in average scores on intelligent tests. Perhaps if you chose a career in psychology, you will be the one to discover the answer. Types of intelligence. David Weschler's approach to testing intellectual ability was based on the fundamental idea that there are, in essence, many aspects to intelligence. Other scholars have echoed this idea by going so far as to suggest that there are actually even different types of intelligence. You likely have heard distinctions made between street smarts and book learning. The former refers to practical wisdom accumulated through experience, while the latter indicates formal education. A person high in street smarts might have a superior ability to catch a person in a lie, to persuade others, or to think quickly under pressure. A person high in book learning, by contrast, might have a large vocabulary and be able to remember a large number of references to classic novels. Although psychologists don't use street smarts or book smarts as professional terms, they do believe that intelligence comes in different types. There are many ways to parse apart the concept of intelligence. Many scholars believe that Carroll's 1993 review of more than 400 data sets provides the best currently existing single source for organizing various concepts related to intelligence. Carroll divided intelligence into three levels, or strata, descending from the most abstract down to the more specific. To understand this way of categorizing, simply think of a car. Car is a general world that denotes all types of motorized vehicles. At the more specific level under car might be various types of cars such as sedans, sports cars, SUVs, pickup trucks, station wagons, and so forth. More specific still would be certain models of each, such as a Honda Civic or Ferrari. And so, <laughs> nice. In the same manner, Carol called the highest level, stratum three, the general intelligence factor, G. Under this were more specific stratum two categories, such as fluid intelligence and visual perception and processing speed. Each of these, in turn, can be subdivided into very specific components, such as spatial scanning, reaction time, and word fluency. Thinking of intelligence, as Carroll does, as a collection of specific mental abilities, has helped researchers conceptualize this topic in new ways. For example, in 1966, Horn and Cattell distinguished between fluid and crystallized intelligence, both of which show up on stratum two of Carroll's model. Fluid intelligence is the ability to think on your feet, that is to solve problems. Crystallized intelligence, on the other hand, is the ability to use language skills and experience to address problems. The former is associated more with youth while the latter increases with age. You may have noticed the way in which younger people can adapt to new situations and use trial and error to quickly figure out solutions. By contrast, older people tend to rely on their relatively superior store of knowledge to solve problems. And there's a really good visual on Carol's model of intelligence on YouTube. So if you can take a look on the different levels, stratum one, stratum two, and stratum three, that would be really cool. Harvard professor Howard Gardner is another figure in psychology who's well known for championing the notion that there are different types of intelligence. Gardner's theory is appropriately called multiple intelligence. Gardner's theory is based on the idea that people process information through different channels, and these are relatively independent of one another. He has identified eight common intelligences, including one, 
logic math, two, visual spatial, three, music rhythm, four, verbal linguistic, five, bodily kinesthetic, six, interpersonal, seven, intrapersonal, and eight, naturalistic. Many people are attracted to gardener's theory because it suggests that people each learn in unique ways. There are now many gardener influence schools in the world. Another type of intelligence is emotional intelligence. Unlike traditional models of intelligence that emphasize cognition, thinking, the idea of emotional intelligence emphasizes the experience and expression of emotion. Some researchers argue that emotional intelligence is a set of skills in which an individual can accurately understand the emotions of others, can identify and label their own emotions, and can use emotions. Other researchers believe that emotional intelligence is a mixture of abilities such as stress management and personality, such as a person's predisposition for certain moods. Regardless of the specific definition of emotional intelligence, studies have shown a link between this concept and job performance. In fact, emotional intelligence is similar to more traditional notions of cognitive intelligence with regards to workplace benefits. Schmidt and Hunter in 1998, for example, reviewed research on intelligence in the workplace context and showed that intelligence is the best single predictor of doing well in job training programs of learning on the job. They also report that general intelligence is moderately correlated with all types of jobs, but especially with managerial and complex technical jobs. There is one last point that is important to bear in mind about intelligence. It turns out that the way an individual thinks about his or her own intelligence is also important because it predicts performance. Researcher Carol Dweck has made a career out of looking at the differences between high IQ children who perform well and those who do not, so-called, underachievers. Among her most interesting findings is that it is not gender or social class that sets us apart the high and low performers. Instead, it is their mindset. The children who believe that their abilities in general and their intelligence specifically is a fixed trait tend to underperform. By contrast, kids who believe that intelligence is changeable and evolving tend to handle failure better, better and perform better. Dweck refers to this as a person's mindset, and having a growth mindset appears to be healthier. Correlates of intelligence. The research on mindset is interesting, but there can also be a temptation to interpret it as suggesting that every human has an unlimited potential for intelligence and that becoming smarter is only a matter of positive thinking. There is some evidence that genetics is an important factor in the intelligence equation. For instance, a number of studies on genetics in adults have yielded the result that intelligence is largely, but not totally, inherited. Having a healthy attitude about the nature of smarts and working hard can both definitely help intellectual performance, but it also helps to have the genetic leaning towards intelligence. Carol Dweck's research on the mindset of children also brings one of the most interesting and controversial issues surrounding intelligent research to the fore. Group differences. From the very beginning of the study of intelligence, researchers have wondered about the differences between groups of people such as men and women. With regard to potential differences between the sexes, some people have noticed that women are underrepresented in certain fields. In 1976, for example, women comprised just 1% of all faculty members in engineering. Even today, women make up between 3 and 15% of all faculty in math intensive fields at the top 50 universities. This phenomenon could be explained in many ways. It might be the result of inequalities in the educational system. It might be due to differences in socialization, wherein young girls are encouraged to develop other interests. It might be the result of that women are, on average, responsible for a larger portion of childcare obligations and therefore make different types of professional decisions, or it might be due to innate differences between these groups, to name just a few possibilities. In a comprehensive review of research on intellectual abilities and sex, 
CC and colleagues in 2009 argue against the hypothesis that biological and genetic differences account for much of the sex differences in intellectual ability. Instead, they believe that a complex web of influences ranging from societal expectations to test-taking strategies to individual interests account for many of the sex differences found in math and similar intellectual abilities. The question for some arises as to the ways in which men and women might differ in intellectual ability, if at all. That is, researchers might examine the ways that men and women differ in terms of their intellectual ability and offer explanations for any differences that are found. Researchers have investigated sex differences in intellectual ability. Overall, much research suggests that there is no overall difference between the sexes in terms of general intelligence. There do appear to be sex differences in terms of specific aspects of cognitive abilities. For example, in a review of the research literature, Halpern in 1997 found that women appear on average superior to men on measures of, of fine motor skills, acquired knowledge, reading comprehension, decoding, nonverbal expression, and generally have higher grades in school. Men, by contrast, appear on average superior to women on measures of fluid reasoning related to math and sciences, perceptual tasks that involve moving objects, and tasks that require transformations in working memory, such as mental rotations and physical spaces. Halpern also notes that men are disproportionately represented on the low end of cognitive functioning, including intellectual disability, dyslexia, and attention deficit disorders. Other researchers have examined various explanatory hypotheses for why sex differences in intellectual ability occur. Some studies have provided mixed evidence for genetic factors, while others point to the evidence for social factors. One interesting phenomenon that has received research scrutiny is the idea of stereotype threat. Stereotype threat is the idea that mental access to a particular stereotype can have a real-world impact on a member of this stereotype group. In one study, for example, women who were informed that women tend to fare poorly on math exams just before taking a math test actually performed worse relative to a control group who did not hear the stereotype. Research on stereotype threat has yielded mixed results, and we are currently uncertain about exactly how and when this effect might occur. One possible antidote to stereotype threat, at least in the case of women, is to make a self-affirmation, such as listing positive personal qualities, before the threat occurs. In one study, for instance, Martins and her colleagues in 2006 had women write about personal qualities that they valued before taking a math test. The affirmation largely erased the effect of stereotype by improving mass scores for women relative to a control group, but similar affirmations had little effect for men. These type of controversies raise the question of if there might be a problem with intelligence measures. But this is an important question to raise. It is important that we regularly evaluate the degree to which measures may be biased against certain groups of people. There is currently a very active and critically important discussion happening among scientists regarding bias in measures against certain groups of people. In conclusion, although you might not be able to spell those words from the spelling bee, indeed you might not even know what they mean. You don't need to count yourself out in the intelligence department. Now that we have examined intelligence in depth, we can return to our intuitive view of those students who compete in the National Spelling Bee. Are they smart? Certainly, they seem to have high verbal intelligence. There is also the possibility that they benefit from either a genetic boost in intelligence, a supportive so social environment, or both. Watching them spell difficult words, there is also much we don't know about them. We cannot tell, for instance, how emotionally intelligent they are or how they might use bodily kinesthetic intelligence. This highlights the fact that intelligence is a complicated issue. Fortunately, psychologists continue to research this topic and their studies continue to yield new insights. Importantly, research is currently being conducted to both detect and ensure that systematic biases are addressed and rectified. 
Oh, that was amazing. You know, I mean, you think about the big picture and everything that goes on in your life and all the components that go into it. But I really liked the example of how positive reinforcement, social reinforcement, and this kind of loops, we we talked about this in an earlier chapter about how parents and how they mm, nurture their children to grow up really has a huge impact. Oh, fascinating. Well, if you like the show, share it with somebody you know. And hey, if you are having a child and you're worried about, you know, their smarts and things that you just don't have the capacity to understand because you think, well, they're smart, but mm, school doesn't seem to be helping them. There are those tests that help out and there are those levels of measurement that do make a difference. So you just have to take the initiative to to make a difference because if you can help your child at every step of the way and help them just move forward a little bit further, a little bit further and just give them that positive reinforcement that they are intelligent they have the capacity they have the neuroplasticity and epigenetics has shown us that we can rewire our little robots now hasn't it and then and then you can live a more inspired life and not struggle through life just reach higher levels and become the person that you want to be